Ladies and gentlemen, brothers, guests, you are in for a treat. Let me tell you, um, we're talking about Protect the Vote on this episode of our webinar series. As we talk about alpha advocacy in action, I am so excited to serve as the executive director and chief operating officer of the greatest fraternity in the whole wide world, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I'm Joe Paul, and I'm going to be bringing up our moderator in a second. Uh, but we want to let you know what tonight's conversation is about. We need your help to protect uh, voters' rights from the unprecedented threats that we're going to be facing this year when we're trying to cast our ballots. Uh, we have an all-star cast of panel members who are going to be sitting here sharing all the information. Of course, our general president is here to share his remarks. Um, we have a feature that's coming in the middle. I don't want to ruin it. You're not here to see me. You're here to listen to our brothers who's going to share some valuable information. The first person we're going to bring up is Brother Cecil Howard. And let me tell you a little bit about Brother Cecil Howard. Brother Howard is a Florida licensed attorney and currently serves as the Associate Vice President for Diversity, Inclusion, and Equal Opportunity and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of South Florida. Uh, Brother Howard has spent the bulk of his career fighting injustices and ensuring equal opportunity and access for all people, either through the court systems or the various administrative agencies, such as the EEOC. He formerly served as Chief Legal Counsel for the State of Florida's Office of Civil Rights, as well as a Charter Officer and Director for the city of Gainesville, Florida, Office for Equal Opportunity, a voter approved office. Cecil is very involved in Alpha Phi Alpha, where he has held many state, regional, and national board of director positions, including the past National General Council. Now, Brother Howard is a member of the board of directors of Hope's uh, Village of America. He is an award winning charity, he has a, which is an award winning charity, pardon that directs resources to people facing hunger, homelessness, domestic violence, and basic needs. Additionally, he serves on the board of directors for the GZL Education Foundation that supports a male mentoring group and awards college scholarships to his participants and is a member of the National Board of Directors of the Florida State University Alumni Association. Brother Howard is a frequent conference and seminar speaker, typically speaking on issues of equity, diversity, board liability, and leadership. He has been a member of the Florida Bar since 1985 and is a graduate of Florida State University and the Thurgood Marshall School of Law at Texas Southern University. He and his wife of 36 years, Miss Priscilla, are the parents of four adult children and two granddaughters. Uh, Brother Howard, I am expecting uh, my check in the mail for reading all of that. Uh, uh, <laughs> how are you doing this evening, my brother? Uh, good evening, Brother Paul, and, uh, and thank you for those comments. Uh, I certainly will make sure your check is in the mail. and. Uh, I will just just tell me what to put on it, and I will make sure I put it in the mail. Well, let me uh, tell it's you, it's going to be up to you to cash it. Oh, I got you, brother. Just take put, the risk. <laughs> in, in the bottom part, just put he's not heavy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Have there a great go. show, brother. Uh, thank you, and uh, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm so excited to be here. Let me tell you, when we talk about voter protection in 2020, let me tell you what you should be expecting. We've got, as Brother Paul said, an all-star lineup here of, uh, of alpha lawyers. These are men of Alpha Phi Alpha who are at the top of their game. I, I'm, I'm the slow one here. I'm learning from all of these guys, and you will see what I'm talking about when we, uh, when I'm done, in, when I'm done uh, introducing these young men, and when we're done talking about what it's going to take to ensure that we exercise our rights to vote in an orderly and a safe manner in 2020. So uh, let me start off by introducing this panel of um, outstanding young, young uh, attorneys. First with us is Brother Stephen Richardson. I'm gonna read some of Brother Richardson's uh, uh, bio here. I might, it's quite lengthy, so I might skip around a little bit, Brother brother uh, Richardson, but you, you, you're just so accomplished, my brother, but I'm, I'm gonna try to get as much of it as I can. So better known as a brand builder and protector, Brother Stephen Richardson, a native Mississippian, enjoys a career of combined media and legal expertise. Fusing those areas are strategy and performance. Prior to attending law school at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, Brother Richardson was a news reporter, gaining print and broadcast experience in the Jackson, Mississippi area. While building his media experience, Brother Richardson tapped into his favorite pastime, acting, public speaking, and modeling, starring in several stage plays, plays, delivering moving speeches, and at a huge moment. 
uh, appearing as a model in the September 2004 edition of Vibe magazine on shelves across the country. Following his stint in media, Brother Richardson pursued his longtime dream of becoming a lawyer by entering law school and bridging his media and performance background to a legal, to a legal education and intellectual property, specifically trademark and copyright law. What better way then to be able to protect the words, the works of, of, of performance artists like himself and other artists who build their brands through creative works? After law school, Brother Richardson moved back to Mississippi and became a licensed attorney in the state and federal courts across the state and in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. He kicked off his legal career in partnership with the state's attorney general's office in 2012 to fight the nation's largest banks during the nationwide mortgage crisis. Under the more than $20 billion multi-state settlement, Brother Richardson successfully defeated Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, City, and other banks to save the homes of Mississippians across the state from foreclosure. He often served as the, le the local legal expert on foreclosures, appearing on multiple news shows and teaching attorneys from across the state in continuing legal education classes on the subject matter. Uh, Brother Richardson was initiated into Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity in, 20, in 2003 through the New Upsilon chapter at the University of Mississippi. In 2006, he completed his bachelor's, de bachelor's degree in English and theater arts at Millsaps College in Jackson, a master's degree in mass communications in 2008 at Jackson State University, uh, before completing his educational journey in 2011 at the University of New Hampshire uh, School of Law. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stephen Richardson. The next panelist is, is Brother Grassroot Smith. Brother, Brother Smith is a commercial litigation partner with Ackerman, a top 100 U.S. law firm in its West Palm Beach office. He is admitted to practice in New York, the District of Columbia, Florida, and the United States Supreme Court. He's listed in Best Lawyers in America and is AV preeminent rated by Martindale Hubble, by Martindale Hubble. He received numerous other honors, including Corporate Executive of the Year by the Legacy Magazine, National Black Lawyers Top 100, and Florida's Top 500 Most Influential Business Leaders by Florida Trend Magazine. Brother Simmons practices complex business litigation and has represented a diverse clientele, including Fortune 500 company, companies, governmental agencies and elected officials, a major league baseball team, and a major online travel retailer. He gained experience at a Wall Street law firm and prestigious Florida firms and worked on bet the company matters involving billions of dollars, including contract disputes, shareholder and board of director disputes, non-competition non and trade secret disputes, real estate and construction defects disputes, intellectual property disputes, government enforcement actions, and Florida Bar disciplinary matters. Brother Smith recently served as president of the Virgil Hawkins Florida chapter of the National Bar Association and is the current chair of the minority, bit, the minority partners and majority law firms division of the National Bar Association. Brother Smith is also the president elect of the Black Chamber of Commerce of Palm Beach County. He's a member of Delta Delta Lambda chapter and is a life member of the fraternity. He also serves as the Assistant General Counsel and Chair of the Charles Hamilton Social Justice Legal Initiative for the fraternity. Next is Brother Dr. Gregory J. Vincent. Brother Vincent serves as Professor and Executive Director of the Education and Civil Rights Initiative at the University of Kentucky. From 2018 through 2020, he served as the 48th Grand Sire Archon of Sigma Pi Phi the Boule, Sigma Phi, Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, the Boule, founded in 1904 as the first African-American Greek letter fraternity. Prior to being unanimously elected, Dr. Vincent served as the 27th president of Hobart College uh, and the 16th president of William Smith College in Geneva, New York. Brother Vincent also served at the University of Texas at Austin as vice president for diversity and community engagement. W.K. Kellogg, Professor of Community College Leadership and Professor of Law. As an Ohio Assistant Attorney General, Brother Vincent successfully argued several major civil rights cases before the Ohio Supreme Court. 
Brother Vincent was born in New York City and attended public schools and graduated from the Bronx High School of Science in 1979. He received his bachelor's degree in history and economics from Hobart and Smith, Hobart and William Smith Colleges in 1983. At the colleges, he was on the Hobart basketball, track, and cross country teams. Brother Vincent received his law degree from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in 1987 and his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania in 2004. Brother Dr. Vincent is a 1987 initiate of Iota of Alpha Rho Lambda chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha and is a member of Gamma Eta Lambda chapter. He's a life member and currently serves as chairman of the Commission on Racial Justice. So as I told you, we have an all-star lineup before us. And, um, and we are prepared to get into the conversation, to get into the dialogue, to talk about what's what 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 we perceive is going to happen and to give you as much information as we can to assist you uh, during these what we consider to be pretty turbulent times in 2020 not 1920 this is 2020 uh that we're talking about so uh, i want to just kind of start off before we really get into it just to talk about uh the issues that uh people of color and specifically african americans uh, have uh, and the challenges that they've uh, faced um, for as, as long as we can remember. So, um, you know, the fraternity, we started with a voteless people as a hopeless people campaign. And we talk about that a lot of times. Well, uh, we talk about that often. And we all talk also talk about an initiative of uh, every voter, every election. So, uh, uh, so we know and we've shown that Alpha Phi Alpha it certainly has its hand on the pulse of what's going on in this country and how we can impact it. But it's important that we continually talk about it. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, is just, just talk a little bit, brothers, about some of the issues uh, from time be before time, practically, as it pertained to uh, obstacles and issues that uh, persons of color, specifically Af African-Americans faced in uh, dealing with issues of voting. So, uh, Brother Vincent, would you like to give us any 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 feedback in that regard? Yes. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank General President Ward, uh, uh, Executive Director Paul, and to you, Brother Howard, uh, for um, serving as the convener for this work, not just this this webinar, but all of the work you've uh, put in to make sure that we're here today. And this is part thank of a larger effort to make sure that we fully participate in our democratic society. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. I think before we get into a larger discussion, it's important to give some historical context and frame the, the permanent interests uh, that we as African-Americans um, uh, must protect and advocate for as we uh, move uh, into uh, the uh, this election and beyond. And I want to just give some some history. Uh, so that we can uh, understand that we're that that we are continuing to fight these battles, but these these battles are not new, and it really goes down to this old adage that freedom ain't free, um, and we have to and and we this is an ever uh, lasting battle. But we knew that as 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 uh, men of Alpha and and, and our uh, um, uh, allies and partners, we know that this has been the story um, of our people. You know, um, in 1870, um, 150 years ago, <coughs> the Congress passed the 15th Amendment, which gave African-American men the right to vote. Of course, um, uh, 50 years later, women were given the right uh, to vote. But this was part of, of the, the first real step to make true the promise of the Constitution by allowing, at this point, Black men the opportunity to engage um, and fully participate in our democratic society. This comes as a crushing defeat to one of the most notorious cases uh, in, um, in our country's history, the Dred Scott case, um, and, and other laws that, that held us down, and of course, slavery. But this law enabled black men to, um, to fully participate in our democratic society. And we saw in, in many of the former Confederate states um, participation and even election of, of black um, uh, congressmen and, and, and other state 
elected officials. Uh, but as a story of America goes, uh, we saw a vicious backlash uh, to uh, those Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, particularly the 15th Amendment, and a, an enactment of both laws and practices that slowly but surely stripped away the rights uh, of, of black um, blacks and particularly black men, but then black women, the right to vote. And so the history of our country is that there have been these small slivers of time when we have been, been able to fully engage um, in uh, the, our democratic society and protect our right to vote. And that really was um, 1870, about to about 1876, and then we saw the retrenchment. Um, we saw that really culminate in uh, the uh, Plessy case in 1896 that codified this idea that separate was inherently equal and really gave credence to the laws and practices that disenfranchised uh, Blacks uh, to vote. We know that there was a very significant um, a civil rights struggle uh, and, 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 a, and a very successful effort to win the right to vote. And it was because of certainly national leaders like uh, brother Dr. Martin Luther King and Congressman uh, John Lewis, who was a young man, and so many others um, named and, and unnamed who engage in this work. But if we think about it, it was, it was such a short period of time when we had those rights. And it was not again until 1965 uh, that we truly had through the Civil Rights Act of 1965, the Voting Rights Act, where we had so many uh, persons who were finally able to fully engage and, and to vote. And so those laws were in place for about 50 years until again, we saw once again, uh, the law retrenched those rights. And through the, again, very controversial Shelby v. Holder case, uh, where those protections from the Civil Rights Act were, were stripped away. And we saw immediately a attack on the rights of African Americans and voter suppression that we'll talk about in a moment. Okay. Thank I, you. I make, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Just, just three, three more quick points. Um, what we what we realize and what we recognize is that these laws are always under attack and we have to be ever vigilant. That's one. Two, we have to remember that elections have consequences. We understand that the issues that are facing our community today are a result of a democratic process. Or so be it's democratic process where this current president will have the ability to appoint a third Supreme Court justice and just by looking at the agenda seems to be hostile to the permanent interest of black people. With the third point is that we have to not only protect the right to vote, which is one of our permanent interests, but we have to protect the permanent interests of, of, of all of our people, which include healthcare, which include uh, jobs, criminal justice reform, economic empowerment, wealth creation, um, the, the, the ability to tell our story. And I just wanna give a quick plug before I um, finish my, my remarks, that one of the things I hope we can do is, is fight the disinformation. And I would encourage you all to take a look at a book that I highly recommend from brother Dr. Ivory Tolson. It's a long title, but it bears the full, um, full reading. It's called No BS, No Bad Stats. And it says, black people need people who believe in black people enough not to believe every bad thing they hear about black people. And so one of the things we have to do is make sure we tell our own stories in a true and authentic way, advocate for our permanent interests and protect our rights to vote. Thank you. And thank you, Brother Vincent. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that misinformation as well as disinformation, but I wanted to uh, see if I could get uh, Brother Smith to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about some other attacks on the Voting Rights Act that, that, are, that are prevalent even today that uh, we need to make sure that we're mindful of and careful about. That historical context, but we know that uh, what happened before is mutating now and happening today. Let me talk to you briefly about Amendment 4, which was passed here in the state of Florida with the intent of restoring voting rights for formerly convicted felons, certain classes of crimes, 
and it was the intention of the state to uh, the, all the voters to, re to restore their voting rights. But what happened? The Florida legislature passed a law which preconditioned the restoration of rights on the back payment of court costs related to those cases. That's what the legislature uh, uh, enacted. What happened in that particular case was the, the ACLU, the Brennan Center, the NAACP filed a challenge stating that that in effect was a poll tax. You're preconditioning someone's right to vote on the payment of some funds. And that case went all the way up to the 11th Circuit. At the 11th Circuit just recently, there was a six to four en banc decision. And the court held essentially that no constitutional rights were violated. And in fact, the back payment of court costs is highly relevant, the court said, to uh, voter qualification. So that's the state of the law that just happened just recently out of the 11th Circuit. Well, what does that mean? There's a group here in Florida called the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. And I know the alphas have been uh, particularly active working with that group. That group is trying to essentially get martial resources of lawyers to come together and go through uh, all of these files and determine eligibility and to see whether or not we can pay back these costs so that we can get the rights restored. I wanna just commend a lot of, of, of uh, uh, celebrities and others that have donated significant funds to contribute to this uh, process. And through that, the hope is that we'll be able to get uh, a lot of folks rights restored so that they can participate in this process. So that is a modern day example of basically a, 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 an effort to suppress the vote and using that through the poll tax. So I, I think that's something that we need to just be aware of. And I'm, I'm sure, because I've had conversation with brothers throughout the country, that there are similar efforts uh, and, and some of them not as heralded in other states. So we just need to be aware of that and, and support organizations that are doing that hard work and what, if you can't uh, uh, donate, volunteer in some fashion, if, particularly if you're a lawyer, to help out. Thank you for that information, uh, Brother Smith. And I will um, just quickly say that um, we know that our fraternity, the members, the men of Alpha Phi Alpha, have certainly gotten involved with that work. We are volunteering. We are we are taking on cases, and we are assisting these previously convicted gentlemen and, and ladies with uh, paying those fines. The funds are there. We just have to make sure we can clear those matters through the court system. So I'm happy to be a part of that. And thank you for, for mentioning that, Brother Brother Smith. It's important that we do continue to provide that level of assistance. But I want to shift. Hard, if, if yeah, I, ahead, just add, I want to add one thing and just underscore why this is important. Uh, the, the, the dissent in the case uh, that I just mentioned, 11th Circuit, noted that when the court, when the Florida uh, uh, officials testified before the court, they noted that essentially it would take 21 new employees to administer a program to try to get these formerly convicted felons rights restored. But interestingly, they have allocated no funds to that, zero funds. I just want that to be understood. That's the reason why this effort that we're trying to undertake is so important because Although the state is opposing the efforts, they're likewise not putting any resources behind allowing folks who genuinely want to get their rights restored to have the ability to do so. And when you hear the term poll tax being used, that's as, as good an example as any that could be given. So I want to shift now a little bit to talk about uh, other actions of uh, suppression uh, that, are, that, are, that are in existence, because we believe it's very important for the public to know uh, any and every act of suppression that is out there, because uh, at the end of the day, if you don't have the ability to cast a ballot, it may be because of some of these types of um, uh, efforts or, or, or activities, if you will, that are at play here. So I want to just talk a little bit about that and bring Brother Richardson into the conversation to talk about uh, under this category of misinformation that Brother Vincent mentioned a little earlier, uh, and, and let's just talk about some of that, particularly what we're hearing uh, from, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, uh, activities that are, that are that are initiating or that are being uh, uh, taken on by uh, members outside of this country. So, brother, brother Richardson, would you touch upon that a tad bit? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Brother Howard. Uh, and thanks for leading this effort. Thanks to uh, Brother General President and Brother Executive Director Paul uh, for definitely giving us this outlet to, to inform uh, the wider audience. And so, yes, so Russia never left. Let's say that. Russia never left. And this year they've added Iran and China. These are all national security threats, foreign threats to our election process, our democracy. And so what's happening, Russia this year has really stepped up its efforts. Back in 2016, Russia basically stole the identities of many different social media profiles and started pushing out information to really hurt another candidate, you know, the candidate they did not prefer to, to get office. This year, what Russia is doing or has built up to this year to do is basically create profiles through enhanced artificial intelligence to create people who actually do not exist. Again, 2016, real people stole their identity. This year, fake people, but who look real and have real names. And when you comment on those posts, on those social media posts, the, com the computer actually automatically responds back. That's artificial intelligence. It's a bot. And so the efforts are enhanced no matter which candidate these countries are, are targeting, all of it is to really bring, uh, to decrease the credibility of our election. Now, you have to think, what two ways can you vote? No matter what these, these threats are, are stating, what two ways can you vote? Those two ways are by mail or in person only. There's no social media voting. There's no text message voting. So it's very important to know that no matter what you receive, what you see, only two official ways in this country to vote is in person or by mail. So you want to make sure your ballot by mail is legitimate by verifying it when it comes in. So verifying that it came from your local election office. Very important. Then some uh, brief questions you want to ask yourself when seeing any information that may be pretty much uh, seen as fake. Does the account have a profile photo? Does the profile name seem real? Is the account more than just a few months old? Does the account have a range of content or just focus on one topic? And does the account have more than 20, I would say actually 100 followers or friends? You know, and then finally, Facebook is notorious for this. When you know you have a friend existing in your friend list, and then suddenly you get a new request from that person, and then you're wondering what is happening here. Well, you accept that person. Guess what? That just may be a bot. Maybe their identity stolen. And so what you want to do is, or that individual who's created this new profile, what that individual should do is to make known the reason for creating this new profile. Because otherwise, you can be submitting information to this new, new profile of this person you think you know and it's actually a case to steal your personal information, money, and let alone in this election time. Okay, okay. So, brother, brother Smith, and then I'll come back to you, brother Vincent. Uh, you know, we when when we deal with a lot of these uh, fake pages and and uh, these bots that are that are creating all types of identities, we also run into uh, all types of conspiracies and consp and conspiracy theories that uh, just take over. And, um, and a lot of us take, a, a lot of Americans and people, citizens, we take these, these conspiracy theories and just, and we run with them and we spread those and they grow even more and more. Can we talk a little bit about that and, and what we can do to uh, eliminate that or, or at least know when to identify that they're nothing but mere conspiracy theories? I, I think first and foremost, we have to understand that we need to go to trusted sources for our, our information. Uh, I'm not going to be voting in an election on the basis of what somebody says on social media. I don't care how many friends they have or how they look or what they may profess in a comment. So I know we'll talk about later in this discussion that there are trusted sources that you can go to, certainly the campaign website. Uh, being one of them. But I think that's it. One, one thing we have to realize, and I, I took a, a, a cybersecurity course at, at Harvard uh, some years back, is the cyber attacks are getting uh, ever more complex. And cybersecurity is really always one step behind, no matter what they tell you. 
So, you know, Brother Richardson correctly pointed out uh, some of the new efforts, but truly there's so many others that, that, that we don't know. What struck me in, in looking at what we've heard out of our security agencies is they really seem to really be playing catch up. And what they've told the public is oftentimes very generic. So they'll say, for example, you know, Russia is trying to undermine the election. But, you know, what are all those steps that are being taken to do that? We haven't received that information. And, and, and I certainly I could tell you, I'm not, not, not being political here, but the Democrats have certainly challenged the fact that we really don't know. Tell us what those efforts are so that we can, we can be prepared. Uh, Iran is getting involved in, in this uh, disinformation campaign uh, and, and spreading anti-U.S. Uh, rhetoric. China has been stated is also getting involved. So a lot of uh, countries are seeing that we're vulnerable, that they can undermine our democratic process. But the point is, you know, go to trusted sources. It should not be Facebook. It shouldn't be Twitter. It should be you actually going out, either talking to folks that you know, your pastor, uh, whoever it may be that has information, and also going to trusted websites, trusted news organizations that you can get information that you know you can rely on. The onus is on you to investigate and determine and be uh, uh, really a responsible voter. So what does media uh, come into play here? I mean, you can sit you can sit down in the evening and watch the uh, national news and depending on which channel you, you turn to, you would think you're in two different countries or three different countries. You can go to three stations and get and, and feel like you're in three different countries. So how does media uh, play a role in this? Vincent, do you want to chime in on that? Brother Howard, um, as you know, the First Amendment guarantees the freedom of the press. And the idea being that the press is one of the most effective mechanisms to get to inform the public about the truth. And the press has a solemn obligation to ensure uh, that the truth is told and to hold government and governmental actors accountable. As you were alluding to, the, the biggest challenge is that we have mixed opinion and what we want to be with what the truth is. And we have allowed uh, the truth to, to be stretched and in some cases trampled upon. We have to make sure that we support our own press. One of the greatest uh, uh, weapons we had in the civil rights struggle was the black press. So we have to support our, uh, the black press and hold the entire press accountable for telling the truth. And as mentioned earlier, we must make sure that we are um, getting good information, good, reliable information, including our own people. And Brother Howard, I can uh, definitely add something to that about the media, about knowing your sources, but as uh, Brother Smith was saying, um, as as much so as the candidates are out on the trail talking, you seeing that daily in the media, um, it really matters what they put in writing. They have websites. And so those websites are legitimate places for information. Also, if they spend some time in, in a legislative body, whether that's federal or, or state, uh, you can research their legislative history to see where they stand on issues, you know, in case their, their website is counter to what they voted on or voted against. Um, and then you move on about the media. What, what, what are your trusted sources? Um, and I want to step kind of back when you're looking at these media websites, uh, you know, are they secure? Something as basic as when you see the HTTP or the HTTPS preceding the website, that S stands for secure. So if you see HTTP on your source where you're getting this information, it's an insecure site. And so that's a red flag there, whether you should trust it. Otherwise, uh, you are vulnerable to some different attacks. Now, growing up, everyone of every age in attendance today, uh, you definitely have grown up with the popular media sources, like your NBCs, your ABCs. Uh, these are your more your broadcasts, your TV sources, uh, you know, even some of the cable channels, uh, cable news channels. Uh, but also in print, you have the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, these are are often trusted sources, although they are filled with opinions in the opinion section, uh, those are those have been proven to be really close on point to what you're looking for. 
But when you're also sifting through all of these media sources, there are some sites that actually copy those media sources and add at the end dot com dot co c o m dot c o. And that means that's a fake version of the real news source. So being very careful, again, at what you're seeing, if there's no author who wrote the story, you know, no author's name is on there. A bad website design in all caps. One example that I found was the Drudge Report, where a lot of things are just in all, all over the site. You know, those things you should question if a story makes you really angry. Hey, is that the only place you're going to land to read that story, you should research it. You should find whether there's another news source that supports it. And then also opinion pieces versus facts. O opinion pieces are just what they say. There's, that's someone's opinion. So you really have, an, have a, a choice whether to, to go in line with that opinion or follow a story that's based on facts. And facts are in, it, Facts are pieces of information that have been proven through multiple authorities. So, so what about all of this, this information, and, and maybe we will call it misinformation, that we're getting as it pertains to absentee uh, ballots and vote by mail? I mean, you know, there are a lot of people who would want to vote by mail or who would want to request an absentee ballot, but are afraid to. They're getting all types of feedback, all types of rhetoric and all types of uh, conspiracy theory, if you will. And we're actually seeing actions now. Let me make this clear. We are actually seeing activity at the post office. I mean, we've seen that. So what, what do you, I mean, what, what's there to talk about as far as that is concerned? I mean, should people, I mean, is this truly misinformation that's out there? I mean, are there concerns about absentee ballots? Will people's votes get counted? You know, what, what's the whole deal about that? So, so, Brother Howard, one, one thing we've not mentioned, we are, as we know, we, we are suffering from the twin pandemic of COVID-19 and structural racism. We talked about the retrenchment of our, uh, of our voting rights at the hands of the Supreme Court. And we also must address the public health issues uh, we are facing that disproportionately and devastatingly impacted the black community. So these these uh, mail-in vote uh, efforts are really there to protect our public health while we can fully participate in our democratic society. Um, we have many jurisdictions that understand that or and are fighting to ensure that persons can protect their health while participating. Um, I would say that um, uh, the political wranglings around this are intense. And that means we have to be ever vigilant and we have to have webinars like this so that we can share information and fight against uh, this tide of repression. And if I may add to that, the Washington Post um, recently published an article that quoted the Heritage Foundation and it found that for the last 20 years, there have been more than 250 million votes cast by mail. And of that count, uh, they found that only 1,285 were proven to be fraudulent out of 250 million. And I've wow. heard uh, from various sources that the, the so-called rampant fraud that has uh, infected the politics, it's really just factually incorrect. It, it's not this rampant uh, uh, fraudulent uh, uh, circumstance. It hasn't been projected. So uh, as uh, Brother Vincent uh, stated, the, the state of our country as it relates to the pandemic in some instances necessitates that you may have to use mail-in vote. And you should feel confident if you're in that position that it, it will be counted. And I'll, just may, I'll mention one thing. There is also a level of disinformation about when is this, uh, when is this gonna be counted? Uh, there are folks that think that, you know, your mail-in ballots are counted if the, rates, if the race is tight. And that's false. Uh, you know, it, it's counted, period. You know, there is a rush, of course, on election night to project a winner. But at the end of the day, all of those votes that are casted will be counted in the final tally. And I'm sure you've seen instances where someone was projected a winner and then there was a subsequent reversal of that because the votes that have been subsequently tallied uh, resulted in the other candidate uh, prevailing. So just be mindful of that. Absolutely. And Brother, Brother Howard, if I can definitely um, have this demonstration here. Um, you mentioned the postal service. So 
most of our audience and and I'm sure you brothers as well may have received this over the last week or two in your mailbox. Okay, it has on here, dear customer. So it's not directly addressed to you, but it's dear postal customer. And so it has a list of things uh, of of instructions on how you and when you should definitely request and, and mail back your ballot. Well, Colorado actually challenged this car and was successful with settling this to enjoin the further mailing out of any postal services uh, election materials un until that state gets a chance to review the content of it. And what this mailer is saying is actually telling pretty much universally request a ballot, request a, uh, request a mail-in ballot. And then it tells you when to request it and when to send it back. Well, Col Colorado ch challenged this because Colorado, as several other states, automatically sends out a ballot. So you don't have to request it. Then two, you can vote in person. You don't have to request the ballot for Colorado. And then voters don't have to mail back the ballot as, as implied with this particular mailer. The voter can actually drop it off at an election office or at a drop box. So this was a misleading communication by the Postal Service. Although legitimate, if you plan to vote by mail, plan ahead, yes. I, I agree, but definitely you have to know your state's rules and your state's provisions on whether your state will automatically send you a ballot or you have to request a ballot. And you should not wait until, as the Postal Service say, 15 days before the election day or more to request a ballot. You should be requesting it now because this, again, is a big election and there's increased volume as well as mailing it out at least seven days before the election day. No, you should at least double that because again, increased volume this year for this important election. And then uh, lastly, I wanna say uh, to Brother Howard, the difference between absentee ballot and mail-in ballot. There's a distinction there because absentee ballots, such as for Mississippi, absentee ballot is the only ballot that can be sent by mail. So absentee ballot for Mississippi means that you have to meet certain qualifications in order to get this ballot. But in some states that are doing the mail-in ballot, whether due to COVID or if it's a state that has always done mail-in ballot, you don't have to have an excuse. You don't have to have a reason. So it's about understanding the rules and the provisions of your state. Do not go by universal mailers like this. Uh, thank you for that, that information, uh, Brother Richardson. And as a matter of fact, from all three of you, and let me just kind of wrap it up by saying those of you who do uh, decide to uh, vote by mail, uh, you can go online. Uh, most supervisors of, of elections offices do provide uh, a resource that you can go online and actually uh, determine or you can see or, or at least check to see if your ballot had been received and if it had been uh, accounted. So I, I think what I'm hearing from the uh, panelists is that you ought not to be afraid to vote by mail, although uh, some in the national media would would, would in fact attempt to spook you. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid. Uh, do it. But if you're going to do it, do it early enough. You know, request your ballot early enough and then vote and then get your ballot back in the mail early enough. Then go and, and check and make sure it was received. Yeah, brother Howard, I, I want to just uh, uh, just amplify this, this this very critical point. Yes, you have an obligation to vote. You also, uh, th and that's a right, but it's also a responsibility. You also have a responsibility to make sure you're informed about the national, regional, state, and local issues in your jurisdiction. You have to. You have an obligation to ensure that you are supporting. Um, your community members so they can get to vote. If you have persons who are elderly or, or have transportation issues, have a responsibility to help them um, uh, vote as well. I say that voting is one of the affirmative responsibilities you have as a citizen, and it's your responsibility to engage in that in order so that our democracy can function, and that, and that cannot be overstated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for those comments. So, brothers, now what we're going to do is kind of pivot a little bit to talk about actually casting a ballot. We've talked about uh, the issues that uh, might impede those efforts. So now let's talk about the actual ballot itself. And I want to get into actually the full ballot. I went, I went to my supervisor of elections office today to look at my ballot. And I wondered when I was doing it, how many people actually see that ballot 
beforehand. So let's talk about that, the actual ballot itself. And should you be surprised to see it, to be seeing it for the very first time the day you go in to vote? What's your take on that? Let's, let's uh, Brother Smith, you want to take this and then we'll see who else wants to offer. Thank you. So it has been stated previously, it's really your obligation to be informed. I can tell you in my county, for example, we receive a sample ballot uh, in the mail. And I can't tell you the amount of phone calls I've received over the years of folks asking me, you know, what do you think about this candidate? What do you think about that candidate for this race or that race? The important point uh, I think that needs to be made is that although there is an intensity of focus on the presidential election, it's very, very critical that you completely fill out the ballot and be informed about all of the candidates running for all the elections. They call it voting down ballot. So for example, I, I'm, an, I'm an attorney. I go and I practice in the courts uh, very regularly. I can tell you that a local judge in your, in most people's everyday lives may have a lot more power than some, sometimes even a president may have in your, in your, in your life. Uh, someone who is running for your state attorney or your district attorney, depending on your, your locale. Someone running uh, uh, to be on your school board. I mean, there's so many races that are impactful. And it's been said before, you have a responsibility to understand not only what they're saying, but what is their actual record on this topic? Uh, that's so important. Somebody, anybody can say anything, but show me what you've done and show me what your record is. So the point I wanna leave uh, with the audience tonight is you have a responsibility before you go in. Uh, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise test. Uh, this is something that you should know ahead of time exactly who you intend to vote, why you intend to vote. Brother Vincent talked earlier about permanent interests uh, and from a historical standpoint. Well, let's talk about it mo modern day. Uh, how, you know, if, if you look at the presidential candidates, where do they stand on healthcare? Where do they stand on jobs? Where do they stand on tax policy? Where do they stand on energy? Where do they stand on the coronavirus uh, situation, immigration, education, a, a black agenda, which is, which is a, uh, incredibly important to us. I'm not gonna give you my vote unless I know where you stand on all of these critical issues. So again, it's on you to take the time. There are organizations, tons of them, that uh, will give you their assessment of, of particular candidates. Uh, but I tend to uh, read a bunch of those and I talk to people I trust and I make my decision based on that. So as, as one of our commenters just said, be an educated voter. And I definitely agree with that. Yes, sir. So let me, I, I, we're getting kind of tight on our time. So I'm, I'm going to throw out a couple of more topics, but I'm, I'm going to kind of group those topics together. And I'd like to hear some more from Brother Richardson and Brother Vincent as well. Uh, and these are topics of talking about the, the actual polling place, going into your assigned polling place, uh, the amount of time you're waiting in line. We've seen a lot of that this summer in the primaries and actually um, being purged. You, you've not voted in a while. You might find yourself purged. And then this whole notion of threats. I mean, there's a we've seen we've seen examples of threats and intimidation. So I'd like to just kind of talk about that as a as a group uh, set of subtopics before we move on, because we do have a guest that's going to come in in about five minutes. So if we can, uh, Brother Vincent Richardson and Brother Smith, you might want to chime back in as well, but let's kind of keep it within that time span if we could. Okay, Brother Howard. It, 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 it is, yeah, it, it's very important that you know that this is your solemn obligation. It's important. So what that means, if, if it's a solemn obligation, this can't be the day of. You have to be prepared and you have to be fearless. Do not let anyone intimidate you or give you false information about uh, what you're doing and take it as seriously as anything else you would do that is your solemn responsibility. Okay. And well, Richard, Brother, Brother Howard, yes, yeah, so, so following up with what Brother Smith said about the full ballot, to help you make a decision, it's about planning your vote. It's planning ahead of time. That sample ballot will really help you plan so that once you see that ballot on election day or when you get ready to mail your ballot back, you're not overwhelmed by how, how many candidates appear on that ballot. What you want to ask yourself is which candidate or candidates have at least attempted to earn my vote, at least attempted to earn my vote. 
whether via TV or mail, in person or phone, who have I heard from or seen? And do their beliefs line up with my beliefs? And as far as the polling place, um, you know, a broken voting machine that has been used as a reason to turn you around or you turn around as a result. If machines are down, you ask for a paper ballot. Time in the voting line. Time in the voting line. Actually, if you're in line at the time the poll closes, you have the right to still vote. Do not get out of line. Stay in line. You have the right to vote. And then the voting roll purge. So it's as, as horrible as it sounds, a purge. Yes, it's, a, it, it's when the state, because of a, a, a length of time of no voting by you, you have been taken off the roll. So that, that poll clerk may say, you're not here. You're not on the roll. So you have to register again. Then threats, harassment, intimidation. It is actually illegal to intimidate voters. And it's a federal crime to intimidate or threaten or curse anybody to influence their vote or right to vote at the poll. People will be near the poll in a certain amount of feet that's allowed by that state. Some, they may be outside of that feet or inside that feet, should I say, and then they will have to get security to pull them back. But the way that prevent being intimidated is to plan your vote. Know who you're going to go in and vote for. Stick to the script. And then uh, there are some other things like aggressively being questioned about your citizenship, criminal record or qualifications to vote falsely representing oneself as an elections official. That might ha happen. Displaying false or misleading signs about voter fraud and related criminal penalties and other things such as targeting non-English speakers and voters of color. You do not need to speak English to vote in any state. You do not need to pass a test to vote in any state. And in some states, they don't allow, they allow you to not have an ID, but just be prepared with your ID just in case. You do not want that to be the reason to keep you from voting. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I chime in just briefly by saying I can't remember the last time that I voted on the day of the election. Uh, I, I always vote early uh, because what I'm concerned about is, you know, something may happen on the day of life happens that may prevent you from being able to vote. So if you have an opportunity to vote early, you should seriously consider exercising that option. I've found that the lines are significantly shorter and I would just highly uh, encourage others to just keep that in mind. Thank you. Th thank you for those comments. So brothers, what we've been talking about and to the general public, what we've been basically talking about are those suppression efforts. What are those impediments? We are going to pivot in a, in a couple of minutes here and really start talking, which I think with Brother Smith is starting to lead us in right in that direction on what can we do? What are some things we can do to get around these? What can we do to protect the vote? Because ultimately, that's what it's all about, protecting the vote. But what we want to do now is take a quick break, not to leave, but we, we have a guest on here. So I'd like to bring on first and foremost. Uh, one of my very, very dear, uh, good friends who I've known for quite basically since his freshman year at Florida a &M University when I was at Florida State University. And that's brother Daryl Parks, who's, who's currently the general president, I'm sorry, Freudian slip maybe, who's currently the general counsel uh, of this great fraternity and has been previously, has previously served as the national president of the National Bar Association. And he's a very, a uh, widely known and well-regarded attorney in this country. And uh, Brother Parks will introduce our guest, who we're very excited to have, and she will give us uh, some comments. And then we will go into the third portion of the uh, event tonight, which is where we will talk about where do we go from here, some solutions and some answers to a lot of the questions we may have. Brother Parks. Thank you very much, Brother Howard. Um, brothers, it's indeed a pleasure, Brother Zeng, excuse me, um, to introduce to many of you, Attorney C.K. Hoffa from Atlanta, close friend of mine, um, the 78th president of the National Bar Association, a president who graduated from Georgetown Law School, who we have the pleasure of being led, all 65,000 lawyers and judges of color in the country. She's leading us on a very aggressive um, agenda of, of battling COVID-19, police misconduct, and election suppression. Um, you know, I knew when I realized that Brother Graffith Smith and Brother Kevin Neal from Florida and I were working on her behalf for election suppression, I quickly said to General President Ward, Brother Ward, 
she has brothers over here working. We can team up with these folks because we are helping leading the effort for the National Bar. She agreed um, thus, and we were able to come together, uh, both Brother Ward and, 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 um, and Madam President C.K. Hoffler, um, for this effort that you're about to hear about. So, brothers, without further ado, please join me in welcoming one of the top, top notch lawyers in the country. She's a bad sister who knows how to really do big things. She's an incredibly successful lawyer in her own right, in many ways, Attorney C.K. Hoffler. CK, you're mute. Your line. There you go. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you so much to Daryl Parks. I guess I should say to Brother Parks, your general counsel. I know him as President Parks because he was one of the best presidents that the National Bar had ever seen. And so um, it is just such an honor to be introduced by him. Uh, Daryl Parks also leads our our task force for policing, police brutality reform. When I see Daryl on TV, and I've known Daryl for probably 15 years or more, and when I see him on TV, I, I beam with pride because he embodies exactly what African-American attorneys internationally should be about. He gets the business done. He's a phenomenal attorney. And so, Daryl, it is wonderful for us to team up at the National Bar with your magnificent fraternity. And um, we are delighted by this. So let me just give you a little bit of background. So this year, um, I, I sworn in in July and I had determined that we we're really facing three pandemics in this country. COVID-19, election suppression and police brutality. Those three pandemics really are intertwined in this country. And so I made it my priority this year to really take on those three, those three pandemics for our community. African-American community, because we are in all three instances disproportionately impacted. Whether it's COVID-19, election suppression, or police brutality, we're it. We are the greatest victims in our community, black and brown people. And so in talking to Daryl Parks, as I said, who I've known for a long time, about how to shape the, my, my civil rights agenda. I had already spoken to the late Congressman John Lewis, um, Reverend Jesse Jackson, because I'm chairman of the board of uh, Rainbow Push Coalition, and they gave me a singular charge, which I then spoke to Daryl Parks about. And their singular charge was, and this was on March 2nd of 2020, was black lawyers need to protect the right to vote. I'll never forget, Congressman Lewis said, we marched, some of us got killed, some of us were beaten so that we would have the right to vote, but it is up to you all now to protect the right to vote because what they knew and what we know is that election suppression is at an all time high. We do not have the luxury of saying, well, yeah, we'll get to it. We have to act now. And as I said recently on another talk that I had, we have to go for broke. We have to act in this election, like everything's at stake. Because literally, I, I will say to you all and this wonderful, wonderful fraternity um, that everything is at stake. Our lives are at stake. Our children's lives are at stake. Our communities are at stake. So as black lawyers, we don't have the right to do anything other than in this election, protect the right to vote. So the NBA has this nonpartisan election protection effort. So you all know this, there's a partisan effort. We've got the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, and the RNC, they have their lawyers that do what they call election protection. We know the RNC has said that they are sending 50,000 people out there really to intimidate voters and they're focused on our communities. Well, they can say what they will. One thing that we know is that in our communities, we matter. In our communities, we have a voice. In our communities, people will listen. In our communities, we are the best prepared to protect the vote. So at the National Bar Association, in conjunction with some of our partners, uh, Transformative Justice Coalition, you know Barbara Arnwine, who actually is the mother of the election protection movement, um, the NAACP, NAACP Legal Defense Fund as well, as Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights, we've joined together and others, and we have formed this coalition where we're going to have, now we're close to 7,000 black lawyers 
that will do election protection work. Now, you might be saying, OK, well, I get it. That's ambitious. Actually, it's not that ambitious when we think about it, because we have over 60, 66,000 black lawyers. I know, Daryl, you said 65. I think it's over 66,000 because we got a whole new class that has graduated. So with all these black lawyers, a mere 10 percent of us is nothing, a drop in the bucket. Frankly, we should have 10,000, but then we would really consume all of the election protection effort. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have, in forming our coalition, one thing that the NBA has done for the first time ever is we have an election protection fellow, a fully funded position. We just hired Lynn Whitfield out of Florida. Her role for the next year is to coordinate all the efforts of the National Bar. As you know, and the reason why I'm speaking to you today, we have forged partnerships with many of the Divine Nine, not all of them, but many. But I'm proud to say that the men of Alpha Kappa Alpha were the first ones to approach us through Daryl Parks and Grassford Smith. And let me just say a word about Grassford Smith. You talk about an extraordinary brother as well. I've known him for many years. We were in the same, I was one of the founding Akusa in our Boule chapter in West Palm Beach many years ago. And he is absolutely stellar. I don't need to tell you that. But as a member and in the leadership of the National Bar Association, he really is tremendous. Your brother Howard, I've known him for many years. We just reconnected because he was a mediator on several cases that we had when I was a partner at Willie Geary's office. So I feel like we're coming full circle. And I have to mention, of course, Al Dotson, who's one of my dearest friends that I've known since college. So we're coming full circle and we, we formed the first partnership with you all, with your effort, with the restoration of rights in Florida. Because we know, and I live in Florida, I live in Georgia now, all crazy things, forgive me for being so blunt, but all crazy things happen in Florida, in my impression. Because I remember when I was there, when we had ballots in the middle of the highway. We have also a system where the citizens of Florida say that convicted felons have the right to vote, to restore their rights. And then you have a, a, a conservative legislature that says, yeah, but you got to pay a poll tax. You see, that's some craziness right there. So fortunately, and I know that you all saw that um, billionaire Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg, today has pledged, I think it's $16 million, uh, no, yeah, $16 million or more. And that's just a start. He's just raised that money to pay off the fines. And our coalition partners in Florida and our young lawyers are doing a phenomenal job with you all in partnership. But that wasn't enough. When Daryl Parks and I talked, we said we have to go further. And the further is also having numbers, record numbers of men from your fraternity serve as our election protection lawyers through the National Bar Association. So the AKAs, when we formed a partnership with the AKAs, they had over 800 lawyers from their sorority to join our effort. Then we also spoke to the Kappas. The Kappas said, well, we, you know, we, we're not, we not going to be outdone by the AKAs. And they've pledged to have over a thousand of their lawyers to also join in our effort. And I know as I sit here today that you all will not be outdone by any AKAs, Kappas, Omegas, or any of the Divine Nine, because I know that you all will come strong as you always do when our communities need you, as you're doing in Florida. So I would encourage you all to be a part of our election protection effort. And I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds just for one second. I don't want to take up too much time. I see. I, I, but I just want to say this. There are many ways that you can serve. Some people are concerned about COVID and concerned about being in the field. And being when I say in the field, being in the polling places during COVID. There are five other ways that you can serve as election protection lawyers that don't involve being in the polling sites, working the hotlines, being hotline captains, educating your community, doing, being part of litigation teams. And there, and we can talk about that another time. And also just being a communication liaison person with all of the efforts of the lawyers. All of that, those four ways can be done at your desk. But of course, there are people that are going to be at the polls. So I don't want to take up much more time, but I just want to say to you all, we have a program that, and we'll have training that is designed specifically for members of your fraternity 
And we are very eager at the National Bar Association to get this going because we have less than 45 days and we can make a difference. And it is up to black lawyers to make a difference. And, and I know that many of you felt very strongly about Justice Ginsburg, as I did, because it wasn't that she was just someone who was a, who was a, a champion of women's rights and reproductive rights. What she was, what she was was a champion of civil rights and voting rights. That landmark, terrible, terrible decision in, um, in 2013, where she wrote this, the dissenting opinion. And in that dissenting opinion, she basically ripped the Supreme Court from one side to the other, saying it was one of the worst opinions because it basically ate at the Voting Rights Act of, of 1965. It ate, it chewed away. And that's why we have all this election suppression right now. So again, just very briefly, I just wanted to bring a few remarks. Um, and, and, and if at all, I could say something about Justice Ginsburg. Um, and, and the opinion, of course, is the Shelby versus Holder opinion. And that was in 2013. We've got to remember that it is in the best interest of those. And I'm being nonpartisan because, of course, the election protection effort is nonpartisan. It is in the best interest of those who don't want black and brown people to vote, to make sure that they continue to suppress us. But we don't have the right to allow that to happen because our communities need us and look up to us. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your words, Attorney Hoffler. I mean, you, you, you're the best. Uh, and um, the work you're doing with the NBA and with this partnership with all of these organizations is going to make a change. And I know the men of Alpha Phi Alpha will be there. So thank you so much for everything you've said and everything you've done. I appreciate okay. you being here this evening. And and I have to say something. I said Alpha. I said something else. I meant Alpha Phi Alpha. I we, made we, CK, I we knew. You we knew what you meant. I know you do. So please forgive me. You know, I like to have it right, but please forgive me. But thank you. We knew so what much. you meant. No, you were you were in a zone, so we knew. I was in a zone and, and I appreciate y'all. So I will be signing off. And thank I thank you. And I will follow up with um Daryl Parks and Brother Grassford as well. And thank all of you for all thank that you. you do in representing. Okay. Thank you, CK. So now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward, I know that the hour is getting close. To, we, we end at 8.30, so we've got a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. But I really want to talk about actually what, is, what we're going to do for Election Day. So, so I have two areas I want to cover, brothers. So let's kind of get into them and hit them and hit the salient points, uh, those points that we believe are going to really be beneficial to our members and the information that they dispense to the public. Planning your actual vote, and we talked a little bit about that, and then actually going in to vote. You know, whatever you do, whether it's early voting, day of an election, uh, 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 vote by mail, whatever the case may be. So let's first talk about, let's spend a few minutes talking about the actual planning the vote uh, in terms of, you know, all the preparation. So let's start off with uh, with, uh, with Brother Richardson there, and then let's everybody else kind of just join in to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Brother Howard. So uh, just to acknowledge, today is National Voter Registration Day. So quite definitely um, key we holding this webinar on a, a national day to get out the vote, get out the uh, registration to vote uh, for the upcoming election. And so it's important to know that there is still time available to register to vote. And you must be at least 18 years of age. However, if you have someone you know who is 17 now, but who will be 18 on November the 3rd, by November the 3rd, 2020, that individual can register to vote right now. So again, 17, but 18 by election day, that individual can vote now. Otherwise 18 and older, I mean, can register to vote, but otherwise 18 and older can register to vote. Then you wanna request your ballot, request your ballot. Here's a game plan I put together for requesting your ballot. Everyone, if your state provides vote by mail, not just absentee, but vote by mail, everyone on this, in this webinar, please request a ballot now by mail. Even if you plan to vote in person, here's why. You can actually request a ballot and then go to the poll and turn in that mail-in ballot to have it voided. You can't vote twice, that's illegal. Although what you may have heard on TV, it's illegal to vote twice. 
but you can request a ballot now just for security, just for backup. You never know if you're going to be sick on election day. Request a ballot now. And then by 5 p.m. on election day, for some reason, if you're just tired of staying in line, you have that ballot with you at the poll in that car or in your pocket. Take it, turn around, take it completed and take it to the nearest post office and drop it in the mail, main mail inside to make sure it's postmarked by five o'clock at your time. Uh, the other thing is, if you want to complete your ballot, if you request it and want to complete it at home, definitely complete it immediately. Do not waste time. And what I want you to do is snap a picture of it for your records, not for social media. If there is any barcode on there, Make sure you snap a picture of that barcode or write it down because that's going to be a way that's going to be a way you can track it. If you and whether it's tracking it on a website that's pro provided by the state or by calling into your local election office and providing that number, then you submit that ballot immediately. As I mentioned, there are three good options. A good option is take it to the post office and drop it in the main box inside the post office before five o'clock that day. So it can be postmarked that day. A better option is if there's a ballot drop box in your community, take it there. That box is usually around the government office. And then three, the best option is to take it to the election office after you complete it and the location should be on that ballot. But before you seal it, make sure you check it for mistakes. There have been a lot of ballots rejected in multiple states because of a lack of signature. And today, because of a lack of a secure envelope. So apparently there was a, an envelope sent out in Pennsylvania that you had to put your ballot in and then drop it into a bigger envelope. And that is on the cusp of being, uh, causing a lot of rejections of your ballot ballots. So make sure you follow all instructions of your ballot. Make sure you sign that ballot as close to how your signature appears on your driver license. And that can help your, your ballot be deemed valid and counted. Brother, Brother Smith, let's talk a little bit about it. We, we, we are right. We've got about a minute and a half left, so I want to get as much as I can. Let's talk about provisional ballots. Uh, when should or should people request provisional ballots or what's the deal about that? What, what should the public know about provisional ballots? Ordinarily, you see provisional ballots uh, and I'm interested in hearing what Brother Vincent may have to add to this. In situations where uh, there might be, there's some infirmity uh, with your, uh, basically it could be your ID, it could be some other issue, uh, and you're allowed to cast a ballot ultimately that may or may not be uh, counted. So uh, what I would say is we don't wanna be in provisional ballot uh, territory. I think if you take the steps that Brother Richardson so painstakingly outlined, uh, you should not be in a situation where you have a provisional ballot. But I want to I want to end on an important point, if I may, uh, Brother Howard. Uh, it was talked about earlier by Brother Vincent that we have the solemn oath to go and vote. We all have that solemn oath to go and vote. This is the most consequential election, perhaps, in our lifetime. But what I want to add to that is, if all you do is go vote. I think that's getting like a C grade. You really need to go a step beyond. Uh, take four or five people with you. It cannot be just you going to vote and you feel like you've uh, fulfilled that obligation that Brother Vincent so eloquently described. It must be that you're going the extra mile, volunteering uh, or doing whatever you can to make sure that it's it, it, you know we get as many people to the polls as possible. So. I wanted to make sure as we kind of get to, towards the end here that we made that point clear. Thank you, Brother Smith. Brother Vincent, uh, did you want to add to any of that? I know Brother Ward's going to be coming on in a minute, but if you want to add to that, Brother Vincent. Can you unmute yourself? If, if you find yourself in a provisional status, vote anyway. Do not let anyone turn you around. Make sure even if you're, in, even if you're challenged, at least um, cast a provisional ballot. Thank you. And Brother Howard, I have quick little final, quick two points, finally. Uh, the provisional ballot. So basically what Brother Vince and Brother Smith is saying, do not leave the poll without voting. 
Right. There's you can vote regardless because of a provisional ballot. Another quick thing. If you have married or have changed your address, relocated since the last time you voted, you may have a new polling place. You need to update your registration. So then we have some websites we should give at the end. And then finally, if you go to the poll, get ready for your lines by creating a voting survival kit. And I would say your state issue ID a screenshot or a picture of your registration card, your voter registration card or your actual registration card, a mask, a lawn chair, water, umbrella, towel, paper fan, pocket phone charger, and some snacks. You will be all together ready to take on long lines and survive this election season. And Brother Richardson, that brings to one very last point, the fact that many of us should uh, probably go ahead and apply to become poll workers or at the very least poll watchers. And um, if we if we take on the role of poll watchers, we should be providing that very kit that you just mentioned, because the general public may not think to bring that kit with them. We know, but we may need to we need we may need to bring cases of water out there, go to Walmart and buy tons of plastic chairs buy um, umbrellas, whatever, or snacks, whatever the case may be, we've got to prepare for those people who are going to be in line uh, probably up to five, six, or probably even longer than that, hours of the day. So, uh, so brothers, uh, as we um, as we get ready to bring on Brother Ward, let's just uh, uh, be vigilant and know that uh, there's a long road ahead of us. But if there's ever a need for leadership, we know the men of Alpha will, will take on that role. We've always done it. We've been doing it since 1906, my brothers, and we will continue. And with that, I'd like to uh, bring on the greatest, the best ever there was, the general president of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Dr. Everett B. Ward. Brother Ward. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Howard. And uh, to Brother Richardson, Brother Smith, and Brother Vincent, thank you for a uh, most informative and well presented uh, presentation tonight. I, it, it, you have given vital information that I'm confident without a doubt uh, has benefited our audience and certainly benefited us as voters in America. There are a couple of things I just want to summarize with that uh, were outstanding. One is uh, be a responsible and educated voter. That was the message that was loud and clear. The information that you provided certainly empowered our audience uh, on how they could be educated and responsible voters. The other is uh, go to trusted sources. I was so glad to hear uh, Brother Smith make that reference that we need to go to those sources that we trust, that we know are reliable, like the NAACP, like the National Bar Association. And please, we are so excited about the partnership with the National Bar Association and having President Huffler with us today certainly uh, cemented our partnership and we will have those lawyers there. But before we leave, I also want to talk about uh, on election day, not only that survival kit, because that is critical, but if a voter has a challenge, what should they do? Who are some of the trusted sources that they should call don't leave the polling place. I was so glad to hear you uh, encourage people to stay in line, to have a have a ballot with you if for some reason you can't stay, that you can uh, have that ballot posted. But can you talk about uh, sources that are available as far as 1-800 numbers and other sources that may be available uh, for voters to contact on election day? Because it, as it was said, the Russians never left and the propaganda is alive and well, and there is an all out effort. And I wanna thank brother Vincent for the historical context that he framed the discussion uh, as we got started. One of the things that clearly happened uh, after reconstruction, the total disenfranchisement of black voters, black men voting was the threat on election day. The people being held at gunpoint, violence and other kinds of things. So we've got to be prepared for whatever will happen on election day. And certainly uh, there is no fraud uh, at the large majority level that's being reported. Uh, as uh, Brother uh, Smith said, it's factually incorrect. 
And so we need to exercise the right to vote. And what I took away from this conversation tonight is be empowered, be well informed, but more importantly, vote on election day. Vote on election day and don't just go yourself. Take five, take six, take seven, take eight, take 10 other people with you so that we truly can recognize that democracy belongs to every citizen in America. And I was so glad that you pointed out, Brother Richardson, that you don't have to speak English uh, to be a voter. And so the, the attempts to suppress us in so many different ways. And Brother Howard, I want to commend you and Brother Smith and the brothers in Florida who are working diligently and working over uh, hours, countless hours, to make sure that men who have paid and women who have paid their debt to society truly are given their full citizenship after making that obligation by having the right to vote. So we wanna thank you for your work that you're doing. And now I wanna turn it back over to you for just a moment, Brother Howard, to talk about uh, how people can, can use that network to make telephone calls. I know it will be posted, but can you talk about that for just a moment? I will, thank you. Will. One of the partnerships we did not talk about was a partnership with the uh, the Lawyers Committee for on Civil Rights Under Law. And with that, we are, we are engaged in, um, in hotline voting where individuals, and many of us are volunteering to take calls. So when people call about election day issues, they may get one of us. That number is 1-866-OUR-VOTE, 1-866-OUR-VOTE. But also in addition to that though, the fraternity itself, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated has purchased its own toll-free number for this very purpose. And it's 1-866-BM-VOTE-1. 1-866-BM for black men, black BM vote one. Uh, so those are the two numbers. And when we when we solidify this, this, this partnership with the NAACP, as well as with the uh, National Bar Association, as you just heard, uh, we will be available on those days because they will have numbers as well for the general public to call into uh, for matters that may be occurring at the poll, at the voting booth. So we will be there to address those issues as well. And then there's a website and there's several websites, but the one website that we're promoting and we believe is most effective, most comprehensive, most robust is vote.org. It's the easiest one to remember, vote.org. You can go into vote.org, pick out your state and it can tell you everything there is to know about your state as it pertains to voting, whether it's your registration deadlines, when your early voting dates, tells you what, whether or not you can vote by mail and whatever else um, restrictions or, and, and allowances there may be, you can handle that. There is also another website that we are promoting and that website is uh, IWillVote.com. I will vote.com. And I believe that's the one that uh, President Obama is promoting. I will vote.com. Uh, the bottom line is that there is there's tons of information out there. There are many resources. We have to take it, uh, advantage of them. We have to make sure we visit these resources well before election day. I'm doing I was doing some of them today. Don't wait until election day. Uh, do it now. Get take a picture of your go go by your voting uh, the, the voting precinct. Take a picture of the GPS and all of that information. Make sure you are very well prepared if you're going to vote on November third. But you heard Brother Smith say he's never he's never he had, he can't remember the last time he voted on November third on on election day. If you can vote early, go and vote early. And if you can vote by mail, go and vote by mail. But remember those numbers. Call those numbers if you encounter any problems, visit those websites, and I can assure you that somebody will address your needs and somebody will be there to assist you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are right at 8.30. This is the time, uh, believe it or not, Brother Paul, these lawyers, as many as they are, as, as many as there are, they were able to get this thing in and out in, uh, within, within an hour and a half. So, you should be happy, Brother Paul. <laughs> I am. You know, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm happy, surprised, but but not really because we're alpha men. So I'm, I fully expected us to be on time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, voteless people truly is a hopeless people. 41, 
41. There are 41 days left until the 2020 presidential election, arguably the most important election of our lifetime. My question is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to help move the needle in November? How many voters will you commit to educating, registering, and mobilizing to get them to the polls? How will you volunteer? Will you volunteer to serve as a poll worker or, or poll watcher? Where will you be on November 4th, the day after? Will you be proud of the part that you played to get people to the polls? Keith Ellison said, not voting is not a protest. It is a surrender. Thank you for joining us, brothers, specifically brothers. If you'd like to recommit to Alpha, the doors of the House of Alpha are wide open. Our goal is to engage you. And the House of Alpha is not the same without all of our brothers in it. So come on back to the house. For more information about our global impact, please visit www.apa1906.net or follow us on social media at APA1906 Network. Brothers, stay safe, stay vigilant, stay healthy, and 06.